There are an abundance of iconic combinations out there, like spaghetti and meatballs, a sorority girl in a white jeep, or depression and alcoholism, but like US presidents and convertibles, not everything can be a match made in heaven. And as much as Mother Russia would love to dominate the high seas, nearly landlocked nations and stellar navies don't exactly go hand in hand. But for all the Russian navy's dismal, underwhelming, pathetic lack of glory in the early 20th century, it's always important to look on the bright side. Like how it gives me good YouTube content. So on today's episode, I'm going to learn you all about the misadventures of the Russian Baltic Fleet. It's the turn of the 20th century, and what better way to kick off a new era than EXPANSION. Russia is cold, which is great for things like stopping Nazis and badass TikToks, but not ideal for ports. Having your port turn to ice every winter is what those of us more versed in nautical terms would call not very cash money. The Russian Empire notices China has a pretty nifty port with, get this, warm water. However, there's this pesky little thing called a border in the way. But that's okay, China isn't European, it's not a real country. So Russia takes control and gets the Qing to lease in the port. Japan doesn't like what they see. So they they meet with Russia and are all like, Hey, vodka boy, invading China is our thing. But Russia won't share, leaving diplomacy dead in the water. But that's okay. The new DLC just dropped and everyone's just itching to try out their new toys. So the Japanese attack Port Arthur, kicking off the Russo-Japanese War. Fast forward a few battles and the Russians are losing pretty badly. So the Tsar authorizes quite the preposterous proposal of sending the Russian Baltic fleet to reinforce the east. And you may be wondering, but Blue Jay, what's so preposterous about sending reinforcements? Well kiddo, the Baltic part of Russian Baltic fleet means it operates in, get this, the Baltic. And as we learned earlier, boats don't like ice, so you can't go this way to Port Arthur, meaning the Tsar authorized a plan for an 18,000 mile journey around the world, which is 29,000 kilometers, or 1,140,480,000 gumballs. The voyage was also a logistical nightmare, as the Russians didn't have any holdings in Africa or South Asia to refuel along the way. Add that to the fact that the fleet spent months at a time frozen in port, so the crew of mostly uneducated peasants couldn't tell you the difference between a bowline knot and a porcelain pot. This group of inexperienced conscripts was put under the command of Admiral Rosetsvensky, a man so prone to anger that his staff made sure to keep a large supply of binoculars at the ready due to how often he would throw them overboard. But hey, fuck it, what better way to learn than a trial by fire, right? So they set sail on their epic quest to turn the tide of the war and bring glory to the motherland. And immediately, the flagship runs aground and a cruiser loses his anchor. While they waited for the flagship to refloat, a destroyer forgot friendly fire was on and rammed into a battleship, prompting it to return for repairs. Don't worry men, surely this can't be foreshadowing. As the fleet pushed on, a growing hysteria spread amongst the crew. They were afraid that at any second, they'd be ambushed by Japanese torpedo boats. By Denmark. This is where the war is if you forgot. But the crewmen didn't have time to worry about things as frivolous as logic. So when two fishermen approached the fleet to deliver a message, they opened fire. The two fishermen survived the false alarm without a scratch thanks to the horrible standards of the Russian gunnery. As for their message, they informed Rear Admiral Rosetsvensky that he had been promoted to Vice Admiral. <sighs> Iron this. This wouldn't be the only false alarm, as later another ship signaled that she was under attack by eight Japanese torpedo boats, only to find out that there were... Zero Japanese torpedo boats. There. <laughs> there was just nothing there. Having survived the Baltic, our heroes made their way towards Britain, where they encountered a small group of fishing trawlers at Donger Bank. But surely by now our skittish sailors have learned their lesson. Ah, ninjas! Straight at this bullshit! Chaos ensued as the Russians laid down hellfire upon the unsuspecting fishermen. The Russians are going bonkers. Some run around the deck aimlessly waving cutlasses to repel imaginary boarding parties, while others just cuddle up on the deck with life jackets, accepting their demise. Keep it up, men! These Japanese have horrendous aim, Igor! We haven't even taken a hit! But, hey, at least it's time we made sure they weren't fishermen first. <coughs> We're shooting at fishermen, aren't we? Definitely a possibility, sir. Well, at least we didn't fire on our own ships, killing a sailor and Russian Orthodox priest. <coughs> the British trawler fleet were sitting ducks as their nets in the water prevented a hasty escape, and the Russians fired at them for 20 minutes before realizing their mistake. While this sounds like the setup for a massacre, you forget our heroes are about as effective as a guy holding a fish on tinder, sinking only one trawler and damaging two of their own ships. The battleship Oriole really captured the spirit of a TikTok pickup artist, reportedly shooting 500 shots without scoring a single hit. Two fishermen and two Russians died in the mayhem, so at least the survivors can brag at the local pub that they tied with the Russian Navy. This event became known as the Dogger Bank Incident and nearly ignited a war between Russia and Britain. The Brits just settled for revoking their access to the Suez Canal, forcing the Russians to make a slight tweak in their course. 
The slow, coal-powered fleet made its way towards Africa, attacking more civilians and cutting underwater telegraph cables along the way. They met up with some German supply ships to refuel due to the aforementioned lack of African holdings to make port. What nice friends, those Germans. I'm sure their relationship will last. Africa's pretty big, almost as big as my self-loathing, so they took on double loads of coal and kept giant piles of the stuff just sitting on deck. Definitely the kind of thing to land you an EPA audit. But it's not like any sailors were going to die from black lung, except for the ones who did. Morale is low, so the Russian crew decides to lift their spirits by treating themselves to the exotic pets of Madagascar. Alright men, you all can- Hey, Igor, stop sniffing glue for a sec, buddy. You all can go to shore and pick out one thing to bring back with you. Nothing too crazy, like snakes or crocodiles. Motherfu- What did I say? Sir, I can explain. Watch it throw back the shot at Tito's. The ship became a floating zoo as the crew brought on a bunch of animals to roam the deck freely, including a crocodile and a venomous snake, which apparently took a liking for vodka. Panic followed shortly when the snake wrapped itself around guns and bit a commanding officer. One sailor gifted the admiral a parrot, which soon took after his rather extensive vocabulary of Russian curses. What? The flagship soon became overrun with chameleons who would frequently go missing due to their ability to seamlessly camouflage. Hey Igor, have you seen Comrade Camo? I can't find the little guy anywhere. No. Oh, I don't think so. Have you seen him private? Yeah, I don't think he's seen him either. But a good zoo isn't complete without an underwater exhibit. And luckily for them, the cooling plant on their refrigeration ship broke down, forcing them to dump all their meat into the ocean and giving them a nice following of sharks. At one point, the fleet was holding one of many funerals for a sailor who died of illness. During the ceremony, the Kamchatka fired a gun salute. Excellent work, gentlemen. Hey, say, you boys did make sure to load blanks, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Igor, you're looking kinda pale there, buddy. After some more shenanigans, like foiling a mutiny and receiving a shipment of fur boots and coats instead of ammo, Admiral Rosetsvensky realized that they were approaching Japan. Ah oh, shit, that's right, I didn't train them. So he decided to run some gunnery practice on a stationary target. Miraculously, our group of misfits managed to score a single hit on the ship towing the target. But hey, potato potato. At long last, the Baltic fleet closes in on Japan, approaching the Tsushima Strait during the night. The fleet extinguishes their lights to maintain stealth, all except for the Orel, which, as a hospital ship, kept them burning in accordance with the rules of war. The Orel comes upon a Japanese ship in the dark. And finally, after an extensive list of false alarms attacking fishermen and merchants alike across half of the high seas, they come across an actual Japanese vessel and determine it to be Russian. So they use their lights to communicate with it. The Battle of Tsushima ensues. Will our gallant sailors hold their own against the Japanese? The Baltic fleet was decimated. 4,000 Russians die with an additional 7,300 taken prisoner, compared to roughly 100 Japanese deaths. This effectively ended the war, marking the first time in history that an Eastern power defeated a European one. Way to go, buddy. Let's add that one to the scoreboard. Oh. Oh dear. So, in conclusion, the Russian Baltic fleet's odyssey around the world is a tale full of shenanigans and blunders, with our troublemaking peasant crew racking up quite the body count of innocent civilians and friendlies before seeing an actual enemy. And yes, while they may have attacked ships from practically every global power, disabled cities' communication grids, killed fellow sailors with gross negligence of safety practices, nearly ignited a major European war, and were about as accurate as Helen Keller playing laser tag, they also taught a snake to drink vodka, 9 out of 10 stars.